Our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Dadal. He's a lecturer in the Faculty of Business and Economics at the Macquarie University. He graduated with honors in law and commerce, having completed a double degree, and is presently doing his PhD on money and banking at the University of New South Wales. His areas of interest are constitutional and commercial law, and he is particularly interested in the intersection between the two areas of law. He has presented papers at numerous conferences, including the 2010 Gilbert and Tobin Center Conference on Public Law. And Andrew will be speaking with us today about the constitutionality of paper money under the Australian Constitution. He's arguing that the founders envisioned only private issuance of money and did not wish for governments to get involved. So Andrew, could you please come up? First of all, thank you to the organizers of this splendid conference for giving me the chance to come here and uh, share my arguments with you. Um, I'd like to start off with a quote. No point of our liberty is dearer to us than that of our money. With it, we lose our liberty. These words were spoken on the floor of the House of Commons on the 21st of October, 1675. The sentiments, I think, expressed uh, capture the intimate connection between executive power and money, and it is this theme which I seek to speak about today. My task is to discuss whether the Australian Constitution permits the Federal Parliament to issue paper money and then declare that paper money legal tender. To answer this question, it's wise first to see what the Australian Constitution actually says about the subject. The term paper money was used in the drafting of the Australian Constitution, but it was not discussed or defined by the delegates who attended the uh, conventions in the 1890s. It would appear that the term had a given meaning that was understood by all delegates and there was no need for further clarification. What was that meaning? Did it mean fiat currency? Or did it mean a privately issued currency that served as a medium of exchange and represented gold and silver coin? How can we decide between these two alternative formulations um, uh, from the text of the Constitution? Taking a closer look at the text of the Constitution, I think we can make a pretty convincing argument against the fiat currency interpretation. Section 51 of the Australian Constitution defines the powers of Parliament. It grants the Federal Parliament the power to make laws with respect to subsection 12, currency, coinage and legal tender. Note here that currency, coinage and legal tender appear in the same subsection, reflecting that coinage and legal tender were to be linked and to be understood within the realm of currency. Subsection 13, banking other than state banking, also state banking extending beyond the limits of the state concerned, the incorporation of banks and most importantly the issuing of paper money. Again, the concept of paper money is presented alongside banking, reflecting a similarly linked character. Uh, and then finally, subsection 16, bills of exchange and promissory notes. Taken from the fact that these instruments are, are noted separately from those referring to paper money, currency and legal tender, it would be fair to say that these are creatures altogether distinct and don't really play into this debate. Finally, and perhaps most damning for those advocating that the Constitution permits a fiat currency to prevail is section 115 of the Australian Constitution. It provides, a state shall not coin money nor make anything but gold and silver coin legal tender in the payment of debts. I could, if I wanted, leave my presentation there and I would feel, <laughs> I would feel quite confident that I'd offered a convincing case based solely on the text of the Constitution that a fiat currency is unconstitutional. There's one problem, however. Australia has a system of fiat currency that needs to be reconciled with this text. To begin with, I would like to note that in, in the course of my research, I haven't uh, actually ever come across um, logical arguments that posit the Constitution supports a fiat currency. It seems to be assumed knowledge. To play devil's advocate, the argument in favour of the constitutionality of fiat currency would be, I, I, I only imagine, section, uh, 50, well, sorry, <coughs> section 5113 of the Constitution allows the Federal Parliament to make laws about paper money. That phrase being read broadly necessarily includes a Federal power not only to regulate privately issued paper money, but in fact provides the basis for the government to issue its own paper money. Moreover, the Federal Government, pursuant to section uh, 5112, 
can then declare that issued paper money legal tender. That all seems like a fair enough proposition, but one problem remains, and that's the obstacle of section 115. It states that the, the states are not allowed to make that federally issued paper money legal tender in the payment of debts. Try that argument next time you get a speeding ticket from the New South Wales Police Department. The thesis I'm presenting today is that fiat currency system in Australia uh, has arisen as a consequence of political rather than constitutional design. In defending this thesis, I'm going to focus on two main areas of interest. The first area of interest that I will be discussing is the English constitutional tradition in relation to the issuing of paper money. I will focus on this for two reasons. First, the Australian constitution is born of that tradition and is a branch of that same tree, as are the American and Canadian constitutions. And second, the events of the late 17th and early 18th century in England capture and convey the way in which paper money enhances and concentrates organised state power. The second area to be discussed in defending my thesis is that of the Australian context and the political manoeuvrings that resulted in the establishment of the Commonwealth Bank and later a government issued paper money that was eventually severed from the gold standard. The roots of the political motivations for the introduction of paper money in Australia can be seen to arise at a time early on in the Australian Federation, when the Labor Party assumed total control of both houses of parliament uh, Labor saw government controlled money as a means to pursue a socialist agenda and thwart the power and influence of English based banking houses in the newly established Commonwealth. To be fair, while I focus on the role of the Labor Party in this presentation, the other side of politics has never challenged the fiat currency foundations instituted by Labor. I will also argue that the means of accomplishing this fiat currency arrangement in Australia were explicitly framed upon the fiscal strategies establishing the, established in England following the Glorious Revolution of 1688, and later implemented by Alexander Hamilton in the American context. Due to time restrictions, I, I don't have time to get into the American context, but it is, it is a, a relevant um, area of, of um, research. It is my contention that the terms of the Australian Constitution have been forced by political interests into supporting this, this system when there is a credible case to be made that such a system was never intended, both in light of the history of the Anglo-American constitutional tradition, the history of the Australian constitution, and just the plain text and structure of the Australian constitution. As the world is move, moving further away from hard currencies and towards electronic currencies, is this discussion even relevant? I believe it is, but only if enduring principles are extracted from the discussion, the one enduring principle that I think can be taken from this discussion is that of limitations. Hard currencies provide a real limit on the amount of money in existence that is outside the control of simple mechanisms of legal manipulation. By not being able to control the stock of monetary wealth in existence, no one is able to arbitrarily adjust the value of that wealth. Any moral monetary system must not allow wealth to be stolen away arbitrarily. Any future monetary system must have this fundamental concept at, at its heart. At least with paper money, there's the flimsy physical limitation of paper, or in Australia's case, polymer. But with electronic currencies, it's basically how many times can you tap a keyboard? Money must be as, uh, as autonomous as possible and free from manipulation such that monetary autonomy can serve as the foundation stone of civic autonomy. I would like therefore to start by going back to the English constitutional changes of 1688 in England. These are the ultimate origins and inspirations of the Australian system of fiat currency. This period is important because it saw the development of the paper money system as well as significant constitutional changes aimed at addressing profligate, authoritarian and arbitrary monarchical rule. Both of these developments are linked. The late 17th century is important from a constitutional standpoint because it is the period when the English experimented with various forms of constitutional government, including republicanism, and finally uh, settled upon limited constitutional monarchy. In 1688, the Protestant William and Mary of Orange were invited to assume the English throne. 
The settlement of 1688, or the Glorious Revolution, saw a shift in executive power from the absolutist model of monarchy to a model characterised by parliamentary sovereignty. Those supporting the changes realised in 1688 hoped that Parliament could control the authority of the Crown, if not militarily, then at least through the purse strings. The real financial power was to reside with the new commercial classes represented by Parliament. As one English parliamentarian noted, tis money that makes a parliament considerable and nothing else. On the one hand, parliamentary forces sought to install a constitutional monarch with limited powers. In response to these arrangements, regents constrained by these new arrangements, uh, starting immediately with William and Mary of Orange, sought greater autonomy. The development of paper money and a system of central bank mediated credit public finance developed in response to this dynamic as a source of funding enabling executive power to grow beyond the limitations of parliament. Financial constraints were nothing new for European royalty, but in the past it was not an assembly that restricted fiscal power, but rather the physical scarcity of precious metals. This saw Spain, among other powers, send explorers such as Columbus across the Atlantic and to the ends of the known world in search of treasures to expand the stock of available gold and silver coin. In furtherance of this goal, it was not unknown for royal houses also to invest significant sums of money in the questionable science of alchemy, where base metals were to be converted into precious metals in order to expand the wealth and overcome the limitations imposed by money, uh, by money, uh, the scarcity of money. I will say a little bit more about this in, in a moment. In the late 17th century, Amsterdam was the commercial centre of Europe and William and Mary being Dutch were aware of the innovations in finance that were arising on the continent. The settlement of 1688 saw foreign policy and foreign affairs retained as a royal prerogative to the executive. That continues to this day. The settlement of, um, sorry, seeking to fund foreign expeditions against Catholic forces and generally shake off the restrictive fiscal limitations of Parliament William of Orange sought willing creditors and or other financial arrangements. One of the main arrangements that arose in response to this need was the chartering of the Bank of England in 1694, prompting what historians call the financial revolution. What the Bank of England was able to do was to centralise the banking system and the issuing of paper money, which up to that point had only been developed and exploited by shrewd independent goldsmiths who realised that the receipts they were issuing for deposited gold were being circulated and that they could issue, use, circulate and loan uh, at interest more receipts than the gold that they actually held. The centralisation provided by the Bank of England allowed for greater flexibility in reserve ratio lending by banking houses resulting in an expansion of credit via the medium of paper money and credit, um, bookkeeping credit. The Bank of England was also able to issue public bonds to raise funds that it could lend to Parliament or the Crown, and the money received for the bond sales could be lent out several fold. When bonds matured, they could be rolled over or new bonds issued to pay off the old. In a sense, alchemy had finally been perfected. As scholar Karl Wennerlind has argued, as the practice of transmutation provided insurmountably difficult, an interest developed in credit money as an alternative method of expanding the monetary stock. In the 1690s, the Bank of England finally engineered a system of credit money. The success of this system coincided with or caused a rapid decline in royal support for alchemy, elevating credit money to the status of sole, tried and reasonably successful mechanism for the expansion of the money stock. Hence, while the prospect of ex expanding the money stock at will might have been conceived in alchemical terms, it only materialised in the form of credit money. By 1708, a mere 20 years after the Glorious Revolution, the Crown had reasserted itself in fiscal matters by controlling what financial legislation could be introduced into Parliament, and by having the Bank of England as a source of independent funding outside the control of Parliament. Although the new source of credit was greatly empowering, the monarch uh, greatly empowering the monarch early on, it also empowered the um, commercial middle classes that were emerging um, at the time. Um, 
these uh, middle classes benefited most from the settlement of 1688 and they sought to defend it because they had a vested interest. They were referred to as the Whigs. <coughs> having invested in bonds and generally having their commercial lives intertwined with this new settlement, they could prove no, provide no real opposition to the growth and centralization of royal power. It would be cutting off their noses to spite their face, uh, given the interest they accumulated through their investments facilitated by the credit money system. The landed gentry and aristocratic classes, however, had their wealth in independent estates and could, not, and could thus present a more autonomous resistance against the expansion of royal power, precisely because their interests were not so tied up and dependent upon the new settlement. These were, became known as the Tories. With private wealth now vulnerable to the alchemy of paper money and limitless creation of credit by the Bank of England, society was transformed into a polity characterised by popular patrimony vested in the prevailing system, where financial interdependence between society and government uh, sharpened and enhanced royal power to the detriment of the intended structure safeguarding English liberty, that is, parliamentary control of the executive. The rapid expansion of credit led to several outcomes. I would like to highlight just three of those outcomes. First, severe boom and bust cycles ensued as money was loaned out and invested in even more outlandish schemes like unnecessary railways that went to nowhere. One such boom was in relation to the uh, company known as the South Sea Company, which eventually collapsed. In response, Parliament passed the infamous Bubble Act of 1720 in an attempt to limit the detrimental outcomes of the financial instability by limiting the ability of joint stock companies to form and operate. Like, as with most legislation, this kind of caused the reverse of the intended purpose of the legislation. It, it meant entrepreneurs had to rely more heavily on loans from banks because they couldn't pool their savings together in joint stock companies because joint stock companies were outlawed because it was perceived they caused the boom and bust cycles. So uh, it just uh, re-energised re the boom and bust cycles because more people wanted more credit from the banks. The second consequence was the system of credit money also allowed the United Kingdom to embark on nearly a century of warfare from Spain to France to the American colonies as England became what some scholars called the, a fiscal military state. And finally, the system of credit creation was corrupting the role of government. By the end of the 18th century, British industry was putting out its hands in search of government bailouts and subsidies. Politicians were closely aligned with commercial interests and money was being doled out to prop up struggling sectors. Severe booms and busts, constant warfare and bailouts. Does that all sound familiar? <laughs> I would like to read you a few passages from a parliamentary debate from the 18th, late 18th century where a parliamentary report had recommended the government take action in response to a credit crisis. The, this debate, I think, captures the constitutional tensions aroused in the context of a credit money system, which is always the first step towards a full fiat arrangement. In fact, by the 1790s, the convertibility of paper money into gold or silver coin was ceased in England due to economic turmoil being faced. And during the Napoleonic Wars, there was a near complete fiat currency arrangement. It wasn't until 1821 that convertibility was resumed in England. Okay, back to this report. As we are now accustomed in modern times, several experts fronted the Parliamentary Committee of 1793 on the credit crisis and explained how many of the industries that needed assistance and money to pay debts and obligations were interlinked with the broader economy and were too big to fail. This prompted the report to conclude that, quote, evils were likely rapidly to increase to a serious extent if some extraordinary means were not adopted to restore credit and circulation. The report recommended that up to 20 commissioners should be appointed to administer the scheme of government funded loans. Now when I was reading this in hands, I'd have to double check the date. Um, <laughs> and I, I fully expected the next line to say the scheme shall be called TARP. But, <laughs> When the report was debated in Parliament on the 29th and 30th of April, 1793, several MPs took serious issue with the bailout arrangements. 
The arguments against the government loan proposals came from a minority of members. Some notable speeches were from a Mr Jekyll, who asked the House that, if the executive government is to interfere in such a case, are we not beginning a system where we did not see the end of it? Amen to that. <laughs> Another member, Mr Fox, noted, if the sum now proposed, £5 million, is insufficient, were we to stop? Parliament and government were to assume a new character and a new function, the one legislative, the other executive. But now they were about to depart from their natural functions and to support the credit of commercial houses by advancing money upon their stock in trade. The system was dangerous to the constitution. In a constitutional view, the commercial should never be blended with the legislative or the executive. It was a measure exceedingly alarming to the freedom of Englishmen. <coughs> Mr Fox then implored the House before they sanctioned the system unknown to our Constitution which might subvert our liberties. A Mr Alderman also argued, how was the government to take what related to commercial dealings into its hands without establishing a precedent of the most dangerous nature? How were the committee sure that this would not damp the adieu of commerce and shake the general principle, which was the life of commerce itself, the control which every man has over his property. Was this not opening the door to the most unconstitutional and dangerous patronage? Good God, did the committee see the extent of the power which this might give to the executive government, a power which was, it was the first duty of this house to protect? The argument that won the day, however, is encapsulated by Mr Pitt, um, who expressed the sentiment that on some occasions, the urgency, of uh, the urgency of particular instances must outweigh general principles. On that sentiment, the House of Commons passed the bailout legislation, ignoring the constitutional arguments expressed. Even though these views were minority views, it was important, I think, that the dissenting views were recorded for posterity. I would like to leave the English context there at the end of the 18th century. The reason why I've spent so much time on the English context is because it reflects the principle that government power becomes centralised to an extent that may prevail beyond accountable limitations when government can control the money supply. One of the most important accountability mechanisms that our system of Westminster, democracy, Westminster parliamentary government is supposed to embody is that of parliamentary control of finances. Parliament is meant to have the power of supply. The system of credit creation and central banking fetters this mechanism by giving the executive a means of funding outside the control of parliament. And even more serious, the executive government can spend more money than it actually has, accumulating a national debt that becomes impossible to service. In the second part of the discussion, I'd like to focus more on the Australian context, the historical and political context. Starting off with the historical context, since 1788, the monetary system in the Australian colonies had been quite ad hoc. There were Spanish dollars in, uh, floating in and out of the colonies, promissory notes and other mediums were being used to facilitate trade and commerce. The market needed a viable medium of exchange in workable denominations, and private currencies started to appear around the 1840s and 1850s. This period, up to 1911, has become known as the free banking era and the Australian colonies generally experienced what has been called the long boom from 1850 to the, the end of the 19th century. Banks were barred by statute from over-issuing against their reserves, but also had a market incentive not to over-issue currencies. All paper money was backed and convertible to gold. In this period, there was one important banking crisis in 1893, but that was based on land speculation and funded by English capital being loaned out through Australian banks. This bubble eventually burst and the malinvestment was realigned within the space of a few months, maximum maybe a year. Compare that to the current financial crisis where the bubble has burst, we're four years in and we're still not really seeing where the end of it's going to come. Paper money that was unbacked by bullion or gold was unknown and thought uh, and the thought of government-issued fiat currency was outrageous. Imperial authorities in London just would not allow it. The main example of this imperial predisposition against government-issued unbacked legal tender notes can be seen in the controversy surrounding the resignation of Queensland Premier Arthur McAllister 
in July 1866. The McAllister administration had taken on a program of extensive public works, financed by quite substantial loans and debitures. When the loans dried up, McAllister took the dangerous step of initiating legislation that would allow the Queensland colonial government to issue paper money unbacked by hard currency and declare the paper legal tender. Governor Bowen made it known, he probably you know, um, relayed this to London and got instructions, you know, don't let it happen. Governor Bowen made it known that any such legislation would not obtain royal assent. The McAllister administration promptly resigned. Focusing on the political context, in the late 1890s, the labour movement in Australia was just getting organised. Only one representative of labour participated in the Australian Constitutional Conventions of the 1890s. From its early years, one of the platforms advocated by the labour movement was a government-owned central bank. Labour was increasingly suspicious of London-based capital and the influence it wielded in the Australian colonies through private banking houses. The, the idea was that a government-owned central bank would neutralise this influence. Furthermore, as with the English experience discussed above, a central bank could, could allow the executive Labour government to pursue its socialist ideals without financial limitations. Labour quickly set about establishing its influence in politics uh, of the new Commonwealth. The main political issue dividing Australia at Federation, however, was not banking or finance, it was trade. Australia's first Prime Minister, Edmund Barton, was part of the Protectionist Party. The Protectionists generally advocated high tariff barriers in order to protect Australian industry. The, protect, uh, sorry, uh, the main political opposition to the Protectionist Party was the Free Trade Party of um, Sir Henry Parks, the, is commonly known as the father of Australian Federation. One of the reasons the Protectionist Party was able to form the first Australian government under Edmund Barton was that it received support from the Labour Party. Labour's influence in Barton's government, and later when it won office in its own right in 1910, put the issue of banking and currency on the Commonwealth agenda right from the start. The Australian Labour movement was, in global terms, a groundbreaking development. In 1899, Anderson Dawson of Queensland formed the first led Labour government anywhere in the world. Granted it was a minority government and lasted for one week, it was a government nonetheless. In 1904, Labour formed a minority government at the federal level, but it was not until 1910 under Andrew Fisher that for the first time in Australia's short history, one political party had a majority in both houses of parliament. This allowed for radical monetary and financial changes. The history of the establishment of the Commonwealth Bank is closely intertwined with the influence of one man, King O'Malley. O'Malley was known to have considered himself the Australian Alexander Hamilton and passionately articulated the case for a Commonwealth Bank. The origins of the idea of a national bank in Australian politics can be traced to the 16-plank platform drawn by Labor leaders in New South Wales in 1891. King O'Malley, a Canadian by birth but American by upbringing, naturally gravitated towards Labour in order to see his plan of a national bank to fruition. As noted by Jauncey, though O'Malley first approached anti-Labour forces who were in power in 1901 to, uh, to promote this idea, he soon abandoned such a path given the business connections uh, such forces had with private banks. It was unlikely that men of such a conservative ilk would support a government bank that would directly compete with private banks. Labour had already been in power once, in 1904, but had refused to consider O'Malley's plan. O'Malley's advocacy at the party conferences ensured that the next time Labour was in power, banking changes would be on hand. When Labour regained power in its own right in 1910, King O'Malley was part of the Federal Cabinet. O'Malley faced opposition to this plan from within the Labour Party itself, and as such, in order to push the idea of a national bank into a viable bill before Parliament, O'Malley became the driving force behind a secret caucus movement known as the Torpedo Brigade. The Torpedo Brigade operated in secret and prevented the national bank issue from being openly discussed. 
This gave the ostensible impression that the matter of a national bank had been settled, and this insulated the government from attracting the ire of influential banking interests. The final establishment of the bank was a well-planned development. As John C. concludes, the Commonwealth Bank cannot justly be said to be the result of a national political upheaval. The bank is the consequence neither of a political disturbance nor of hasty uh, political action, but rather the result of calm conjecture in the time of prosperity. In 1911, a tax was placed on privately issued paper money, driving that part of the banking industry into the ground. And the Treasury directly took over the issuing of paper money. Upon its establishment, the Commonwealth Bank was not established as a central bank. It had the ordinary powers of a chartered bank, with the important exception that it was the banker to the Commonwealth and immune from state and federal taxes. The Commonwealth Bank would operate as an ordinary trading bank, it doesn't sound quite ordinary, does it? It's a normal bank, except it doesn't have to pay tax. <laughs> um, the Commonwealth Bank would operate as an ordinary trading bank, but it would also set up a savings bank business that would take over the saving facilities that uh, up to that time were being operated by the post offices. And when I was reading the constitutional debate in the 18, of the 1890s, there was a big deal made about federal control of post offices. And I was thinking, like, what's, they're going to control mail. Well, why are you up in arms about this? The reason was because post offices were also savings banks and people put money in there and um, state or colonial governments could borrow money from the post offices as a form of funding expenditure rather than having to go to the banking sector. So the Commonwealth Bank took over that function as well. During the First World War, the Australian government determined that large parts of the banking sector were to be brought under the direct control of the government. The modalities of this initiative required the Commonwealth Bank to take a leading role in the organisation and administration of the banking industry, in line with government requirements. This episode meant that the stature and importance of the Commonwealth Bank to the federal government was consolidated and its position as an integral institution of national importance was confirmed. The Commonwealth Bank also took over from private banks the note distribution functions, which was replacing old notes privately or publicly issued for new notes, and exchanging denominations and converting uh, notes into gold. The actual issuing of paper money remained the province of the Treasury until 1924, when this function also was handed to the Commonwealth Bank. In 1932, the gold standard was ceased, and the notes issued by the Commonwealth Bank were no longer backed by gold, yet remained legal tender. The enhancement in royal power experienced in England through the credit money arrangements facilitated by the Bank of England in the late 17th and 18th centuries were mirrored in the establishment of the Commonwealth Bank and the expansion of the fiscal scope available to the federal government in Australia. It's the same trick in a different context. <clears throat> The accepted approach to constitutional reasoning in Australia is that first we look at the text of the Constitution. If it's indeterminate, then we can examine other considerations in order to furnish the Constitution with meaning. One of the approaches which the High Court has in the last 20 years adopted in this context is the use of history in constitutional reasoning. Even if we make the unwarranted concession that the text of the Australian Constitution is unclear on this point, of whether federally issued fiat currency is constitutional, my contention is that the historical record provides a similar perspective on the unconstitutionality of paper money. In order to sustain an argument that the text of the Constitution permits a fiat currency, you must subscribe to a constitutional philosophy whereby the, the document can be bent and stretched to meet emerging needs of a changing society. The Constitution is thus a toolbox facilitating the government, rather than a limit on government power. In recent years, the question of paper money under the Australian Constitution has been brought to the, to the courts on several occasions by one man, Mr Alan Skyring. Mr Skyring has consistently argued that paper money in Australia is unconstitutional. Mr Skyring is an engineer by training and he always represents himself in court proceedings even before the High Court. Such are his convictions on this matter that Mr Skyring once defaced an Australian banknote, something I remember Paul Keating doing as well, uh, in, order, in order to bring the matter before the courts and present his argument. 
Unfortunately, he was eventually convicted for the crime and his argument was dismissed without really engaging with its merits. On another occasion, Mr. Skyring attempted to pay registration costs for a state election in Queensland with gold coins, as is required under Section 115 of the Australian Constitution. When the coins were refused, Mr. Skyring um, took the registrar to court. Uh, the court, again, the Queensland court dismissed his argument without really taking it seriously. The courts have consistently rejected Mr. Skyring's submissions on this point and he now has been listed as a vexatious litigant. Can't go to court anymore unless the court says you can come to court. <laughs> Unfortunately, his arguments... Sorry. Um, to his credit, Justice Kirby in 1998 once gave Mr Skyring over an hour to make his submissions in chambers. On reading the full transcript of the proceeding, it is obvious that Mr Skyring is sincere and indeed knowledgeable about legal procedure. But unfortunately his arguments are unfocused, repetitive and imprecise. The argument he presents as I read it is based solely on section 115 with little if any recourse to historical context. The High Court has dismissed this line of argument with minimal engagement in its merits by concluding that this restriction under section 115 binds the states but it doesn't bind the federal level. For a long period of its history, the High Court of Australia has tried to maintain what's called a legalist approach to constitutional decision making by making scant, if any, use of historical context. In the last 20 years, however, this has been shifting and history has grown as a prominent part of the High Court's constitutional reasoning. The High Court has often used concepts outside the text of the Constitution to give the text of the Constitution meaning. For example, the concepts of the separation of powers or responsible government are, are not uh, explicitly stated in the Constitution. They come from English traditions and are outside the document, yet the court can rely on those outside considerations to give the Constitution meaning. As such, what this paper is arguing is that history illuminates the relationship between the concept of accountable Westminster government and paper money. Seen through this prism, the framework that emerges is one where fiat currency is positively correlated with a reduced executive accountability. As such, what I submit is that if it is to be maintained that the text of the Constitution is unclear on this point of the constitutionality of um, paper money and it needs a secondary mode of interpretation, the Constitution should be interpreted in a way that takes account of history or at least general constitutional principles that enhance rather than reduce executive accountability to parliament. Even if the strong economic arguments against fiat uh, currencies are put to one side, any way you slice it, looking at the text of the constitution, looking at history, uh, or examining broad constitutional principles such as executive accountability, the conclusion is inevitable, inevi the conclusion is inevitably that even on strict constitutional grounds, the constitutionality of fiat currency must be questioned. Thank you very much.